Arsenal, brilliant against West Ham. We're going to break down how they did it. 6-0 and a really good way to build on the 3-1 win against Liverpool. Arteta is getting everything right, especially when you think before the Dubai trip, that little international break, we were talking about fluidity issues. We did videos on this channel talking about how Arsenal can just tweak little things and hopefully get so much more. And I think we're seeing that here. Arteta, it's clever. This isn't just Arsenal refresh, turning up and doing well. Arsenal and Arteta are doing things differently and it's paying dividends. I'm here to break it down with Graham. Graham, how are you, mate? I'm very well, James. Yes, whatever Arteta and Arsenal did in Dubai, it's certainly working, isn't it? Mm. That's, uh, since Arsenal returned from Dubai now, that's uh, four games, four wins, 16 goals scored. Uh, and yesterday they emphatically and ruthlessly dispatched West Ham 6-0, which is, equals, I think, Arsenal's biggest ever away win. Uh, the previous best was 7-1 against Aston Villa in 1935. Arsenal exploited West Ham's weakness at set plays yesterday and also down West Ham's left-hand side in behind Emerson with fluid, uh, breathtaking football. Four goals in 13 first-half minutes. A, a first-half annihilation, James, I felt. Yeah. The first-half numbers were staggering when you looked at them at half-time. I think Arsenal had 15 shots in the first half to West Ham's one. 25 touches in the West Ham box to their zero. 3.38 uh, XG to West Ham's 0.01. And we also had 14 key passes in that first half to West Ham. The whole of the West Ham team, zero. So early in the season, West Ham beat Arsenal twice with a 5-1 aggregate, but significantly in those games, James, they scored the first goal. And I thought this was key yesterday, getting that first goal, because if West Ham got the first goal, they had something to sit in on. They didn't get that yesterday. And in then, this was a, a complete performance by Arsenal, who built on that Liverpool result now and are firmly back in the title race, just two points behind Liverpool. Yeah, totally agree. And the match stats show a lot of Arsenal's domination in numbers. 25 shots to their 5, 12 shots on target to their 1. 12 shots on target is a really good, I guess, conversion rate is not the word, but, you know... It, it, the conversion rate was 6, was, was 50%, well, well, wasn't it? Well, well, that's, well that's true. Uh, I just mean in terms of how many of the shots actually were on target, asking a question yeah. of Ariel. And of course, there are other near misses. Saka put ahead of wide. Trossard put ahead of wide. There could have been a lot more in this game. 6-0, honestly, it could have been 7, 8 and 9s. Their one shot on target, impressive to limit West Ham that much. But they didn't have a touch in the box. So about the 65th, 70th minute as well. This was total and utter domination and control from Arsenal. But as Arteta has been saying, recently there's a little bit of chaos in there but in a good way 70 percent of the ball arsenal had 650 plus passes an xg of 4.36 according to the xg philosophy the attacking stats look good with final third entries deep touches zone 14 touches way up there and a almost 75 percent field tilt and things look very good on the defensive numbers as well as you can see there 7.6 passes per defensive action for arsenal west ham a lot higher as they did sit a bit deeper got some extra stats though to add to what we said there that apparently Declan Rice had a two percent chance of scoring that absolute screamer and that's just from a football statistical perspective you add to that the weight of the occasion for him returning to West Ham to do what he did there phenomenal moment but also I want to look at where Arsenal's XG against West Ham actually ranked amongst all other Premier League games this season you can see quite a lot of them there but it sits second with under stats XG of 4.00 against West Ham, second only to Bournemouth. But the reason this is the most impressive set of numbers from an XG perspective that we've put up in the league so far this season is because that Bournemouth game had two penalties in it as well. We know that penalties are always super high XG value. So this was, we, we throw around perfect away performance. Sometimes we're talking about a 2-0 win away at Goodison or whatever. This was genuinely perfect. We, we couldn't have done anything better. I, I couldn't have asked of anything more. No complaints from me today, nothing. Not even scraping the barrel stuff. Arsenal were superb. Yeah, they were. Uh, the first 20 minutes for me felt a little bit like cat and mouse. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As, uh, both teams seem to be figuring each other out. West Ham sitting as normal in their very low block. Um, but I thought slowly but surely Arsenal uh, gained in ascendancy in the game. Uh, and I think it was interesting the way Arsenal set up yesterday. I know we're going to go into it when we do the tactical breakdown. But uh, when I did the show with you against Fulham, uh, when we lost 2-1, we did talk that day about the issues we had. Now, obviously, this game, no Zinchenko again, he was missing. Uh, Jesus was out again, party not available. So we had a lot of ball progressors missing and a lot of players who could influence build-up. So it was always going to be interesting to see how Arteta sort of like went with the build-up. He did some absolutely amazing tactical things in this game, mm -hmm. I thought, tweaking the way the defenders played. And a significant thing that he learned from the Fulham game where he used... I thought Kivor more in the left-sided inverted role 
And this in this game, he gave that job to Ben White. Yeah, I totally agree. And we're going to do a segment on Ben White because I thought his the use of him tactically was interesting. But first and foremost, there were actually things that felt like a building on from what we did against Liverpool. So if we just move everyone to position a little bit, you talked about the 4-2-4 build up a little bit where Havertz who basically doesn't seem to be, and I mean this in a nice way, he doesn't seem to be really wanted in build-up. He's kind of there to be, you know, in the last phase. But our fullbacks split and got higher up the pitch. And this was more how we looked against Liverpool again with, you know, Rice there, but it was Jorginho last time. Erdegaard dropped deeper in the absence of Jorginho to ensure that Havertz was still in that sort of box shape that we talked about against Liverpool and not essentially having Havertz having to drop deep with Rice over there. There we go, that's what I'm trying to show. We had him up there and Erdegaard had a tweaked role rather than being so high up the pitch um, when in possession like it was against Liverpool. Yeah, Liverpool, uh, West Ham didn't press as aggressively as what Liverpool did, but I think mm. this 4-2-4 build-up shape was to play around their press. Uh, they have got a very limited press, but I think this is what he did to actually play out and play around them and to get our ball players on the ball. And it was interesting, I thought, in the game that Odegaard a lot in this game was coming deeper uh, to sit along with Be Declan Rice. And, and also it was significant that sometimes Odegaard and White were changing positions. Mm -hmm. You know, White was coming inside and mm -hmm. Odegaard was going up high. So then we got the five lanes. Mm -hmm. The role of Trossard was very interesting. He was off the ball, almost like an eight, nine, mm -hmm. even a, a ten. You know, yeah. he was so fluid with his movement and he was exchanging positions with uh, Martinelli and Havertz all game. But I thought principally, I think the, the, the shape that he went with in this game respected, I thought, West Ham in transition because the, mm. their threat is, make no mistake, Kudos, mm. who's their key outlet. Mm. He, he's been brilliant this season. And also Gerard Bowen. Mm. They are their strong players in transition. I think he wanted Kivor to take care of Kudos. He had Gabriel on the left-hand side. And we're going to talk about later how when Saliba went more forward, even, as yeah, he did. even he overlapping forward, yeah. at times in the second half, Gabriel became more central. But I thought he played to the strengths of the team. You know, the off-the-ball mm -hmm. players were in the right positions to deal with their threat, and the on-the-ball players were in the right positions to what I thought he saw tactically how he was going to expose West Ham. That was mm -hmm. not just their fragility from the set plays, which played out in that first half, but it was almost like going down our right-hand side, their left-hand side. Emerson, they were looking to get in behind him. So what you saw in that first half, I thought, was Saka coming inside a lot, Odegaard joining the attack, or maybe mm. White joining the attack, mm -hmm. and, and we were sort of like trying to sort of like get into the space behind Emerson and exploit their left-hand side, James. Yeah, I completely agree. In fact, something's just popped back into my head that I hadn't really planned to talk about. I do want to talk about it very quickly before we hone in on the Ben White stuff even more. If I just move them back into a little bit of a shape West Ham here for a second, did you find, I don't know if it was just me, let us know in the comment section below if any of you noticed this, it felt to me, if we just move everyone back just a touch, sorry, bear with me everyone. So it felt like there were times where in possession we talked about this kind of shape with Erdegaard dropping back. I also felt while that was on the ball, I felt off the ball, these four then kind of alternated. So Trossard came across here, Erdegaard went to press with Trossard, his work rate was unbelievable. And then Rice and Havertz, was, and this was almost our off-the-ball pressing shape. You know, and it felt like we did, a, we did a whole segment on Tactical Insight. I think it was after we beat Brighton when Havertz scored that goal. And I basically said, and I mean it's in the nicest way, he's kind of there to do everything without the ball. Now, a lot of people go, 65 million pounds for a player you don't want on the ball. I just thought on the ball, Havertz was really good. Played some really nice set balls into the area. And I thought, did well in the final third. But there was almost this like, you two go press, Trossard and Odegaard go set the tone, go press onto these two, you know, Trossard do the same. And then when we did get the ball and we were, you know, had a bit of sustained possession, you were formed into this shape. And whether it was Ben White inverting, which we'll talk about in a sec, whether it was Erdegaard dropping deep, Havertz would then sort of stroll into this, he was always looking at this back post area. And Trossard was then picking up the ball and dropping super deep. And you basically ended up with this kind of shape in possession. And then you saw it when, if we just give him a ball, when we won the penalty, is Trossard in this area of the pitch who spotted a run from Saka in behind, 
when Trossard has played that raking pass. When you look at it, Saka, Martinelli and Havertz are the three highest players in that move. So I just found it interesting the way that four there to constantly rotate and mix up their roles on and off the ball. And Havertz seems to be there to always pick up the second ball. If it goes long and they win a header, Havertz is kind of there to sweep up and keep the ball, you know, keep the ball moving. His position is really good. And I just felt this was the most tactically fluid we've looked all season, like last season's Arsenal. Sometimes Havertz was wide so that Martinelli could pick up a, a central space and he'd hug the touchline. Constant rotations and moving from Arsenal. And it, I just think it must have been a nightmare for West Ham to deal with. They struggled with our off-the-ball movement. Um, and I think, interesting you mentioned about Kai Havertz, first of all. Havertz last week against Liverpool, against a top team, yeah. uh, played centre-forward, didn't he? So yeah. he was someone that we used as a target man against uh, and he was in that position against uh, Manchester City as well in the Community Shield and in the league game. When you're playing a team who sit uh, with a low block, who don't probably uh, uh, press onto you so high, uh, he becomes that sort of player that Arteta wants to use in that left-sided eight, really for his off-the-ball work, which enables the team to flourish in other areas. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this, for me, was Martin Odegaard's best performance of the season sublime. yesterday. I mean, the numbers that he put up in the game yesterday completed over 100 passes, he created seven chances, uh, and he had two assists. Uh, and that's the best, I think, since records have begun in, in the Premier League since 2003-04. He was absolutely everything for our team yesterday. He talked about the fluidity. It came from Odegaard, who always appreciated where to be to receive the ball. Mm -hmm. you know, whoever had the ball, he was there to receive it. Whether he was playing deep or whether he was coming up high, he was always available to take the ball off the player to then make something happen. He was key to that fluidity. But you are right, there was tremendous movement between Trossard, Havertz, uh, Martinelli and Odegaard. It was incredibly fluid. It must have been very difficult for West Ham yesterday to contain. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, you mentioned Ben White um, and him inverting and the fact that Arteta did something different with the makeup of the back four and the build-up. I think this is crucial. I think this is a huge part as to why we won. Now, when we were live on the Starting Eleven show, this is, and listen, I understand, right? We, we all come, we give our opinions and some people... Agree, disagree, and if you're wrong, people come and go, oh, what you can pay about now? So I, along with some others on the panel, had real fears about the 11 that went out. We then end up finding out that Jorginho being on the bench wasn't tactical, he wasn't fit to play, and a few other players were missing, Tommy Asher wasn't available. So to a degree, Arteta's hand was forced to, to a point. But that doesn't mean that the way he approached the game tactically was forced, and that's what was fascinating. Let me tell you what I expected to happen in this game, because we saw it against Fulham. So, Trossard's leading the line. Now, it was Eddie and Ketty against Fulham. Important to remember that. I thought the shape was going to look like this. Erdegaard and Havertz in the pockets. Your wingers holding the touchline. And Kivio moving inside. And it was very uncomfortable. So you have the back three in the build-up shape. You guys are no strangers to this. We have talked about this a thousand times on this show. But he flipped it. He actually said, Kivio, you looked uncomfortable there. It's not your natural position. I actually trust... Gabriel and Saliba to shift more than I trust Kivio to come inside and become a playmaker. So that's what happened. Rice moves over. He got Ben White, who is excellent on the ball, one of the best ball playing defenders in the league. And he asked Gabriel, Saliba and Kivio to mix up. It gave Gabriel a really good battle with Jared Bowen that I thought he did really, really well in. Now, why is this really important to know? Well, let me show you some graphics first. We've got here the White's touch map. You know, again, lots of sort of, you know, touches in very central areas. We've also got his pass map from the first half. 37 out of 38 passes were completed. Now, this is just to give you an oversight of sort of, you know, a lot of the areas of the pitch he was playing in. But I've got here what I've called Arsenal's connectors. Now, when Arsenal play, often to progress up the pitch, there are certain players, you mentioned it, Jesus, Sinchenko, they're really good ball progressors. Granit Xhaka was one as well. When we had Kivio and Havertz, it was very uncomfortable trying to watch Kivio in this inverted area, trying to progress to Havertz or into Eddie Nketiah in that game against Fulham. It really, we couldn't do it. We couldn't play through them. We looked so unnatural. In this game, the focus was play through Ben White, play through Erdegaard. And if Ben White does go wide, like you said, Erdogan dropped in there. So he had much better natural progresses through the pitch. And you see that in the numbers, and we've got it here. Versus Fulham, what I've got, and versus West Ham, I've got them side by side, these numbers. We've got progressive passes from the inverted wing back, so that is Kivio and Havertz, the number eight there. And of course, when I'm compa uh, comparing it to West Ham, I'm talking about White and Erdogan. 
14 progressive passes against Fulham across that dynamic of the team. Against West Ham, it went up to 29. Passes to the final third, seven against Fulham in the 2-1 defeat, 11 against West Ham. And from those same players, the progressive passing distance was almost double, 369 yards, or it was more... I can't do maths. 770 yards was the progression is more. Anyway, significantly better numbers in terms of the way we progress by having White and Erdegaard be the focal point of that team so Havertz could get a little bit closer to the striker, move forward, we weren't relying on Kivior to do it. But we've also got this. Passes received from the striker. In this game, it was Trossard, not Eddie Nketiah. You can see he received 44 passes against West Ham compared to Eddie Nketiah's 15 against Fulham. And he had eight touches in the penalty area compared to Eddie Nketiah's too. So the dynamics to switch it and go, yeah, I agree. Kivior into Havertz, it didn't work. But by flipping it, making Erdegaard and White have to take on that responsibility, it gave Arsenal so much more running up the pitch. And this graphic from Mark Arstat showing Arsenal's you know, shape and their connectivity from minute one to 74 shows you everything. Look at Ben White's position and look at the, you know, the thickness of those arrows and the combinations between number 41, number two, number four and number eight. It's all about this side of the pitch working so well, Graham. You know, we've talked about on this show before about putting people in the positions where they are strongest to yeah. suit their skill sets. Now, Ben White, when he was at Leeds, yeah. played in this sort of midfield yeah. role. Um, now, what I like about this is that, uh, first of all, for Ben White, and he was excellent yesterday. He was excellent last week as well, and he seems to be coming back into some sort of form. Yeah. Is I think what he's good is he, he's very good at passing. He's very good at sort of like knocking in a long pass. He's very good at appreciating space and able to sort of receive the ball comfortably and play the ball. That is his skill set. Now, I think that sometimes when he's out wide, mm -hmm. his weakness is in the 1v1 duels out wide. Yeah. You know? And I think by pushing him inside and moving Saliba across and then moving Gabriel across, I think you're playing more to Ben White's skill set. So he's very comfortable in this position, and I think that suits him to play there. Mm. And I think uh, it also suits the back three. You know, if you think about it, Saliba pushes across. Mm -hmm. Gabriel, who scored his 14th goal in his 150th appearance for Arsenal yesterday, is now being trusted to play out through the centre of the pitch. Yeah. And his passing has improved yeah, over the course of the season. And Kivor is very good He's very comfortable, Kivor. I like yeah. him. And I thought he was excellent. So what you've got is... To take care of West Ham's strengths or their strengths on the ball, you've got our best off the ball players uh, against their strength on that side. And then you've got our best on the ball players on the right hand side against their weak side, which is their left hand side. So I thought Arteta did it really well yesterday. He recognised where West Ham's weakness was, which was Emerson's side. He recognised where West Ham's strengths were. So he set us up in a way to deal off the ball with their best on the ball players and use our best on the ball players against their weak off the ball players. So I thought it was tactically well done by him and I thought Ben White was instrumental to everything as we said uh, I said in the Fulham uh, in the video we did after the Fulham game on Tactical Insight you know that for me was the obvious solution to move him yeah. invert him rather than Kimball. You did say it yeah. I and, I, and I did say that after that game if you go back and watch that uh, Tactical Insight show v Fulham I did say that and he did it yesterday and it worked absolutely uh, it worked to a, t to a t, didn't it? And, it, uh, it raised our levels. It massively. raised our levels and also the understanding with Odegaard, mm. you know, Odegaard and White uh, was absolutely phenomenal yesterday. And that allowed Saka then to make these runs. And what yeah. we also saw then was White occasionally, when Odegaard dropped, joining Saka up wide. So there's our five lanes. And you've got a fullback up high and Saka coming inside, sort of uh, mm. inside more. Trossard, Havertz and Martinelli there. And then occasionally you even saw William Saliba which yeah. I haven't seen before. My son yeah. says to me that when he played for Marseille, he was always like the marauding mm. fullback up high. So if White dropped back, you even had yeah. Saliba going high. This is how fluid Arsenal were yesterday. But I thought this right-hand side with Saliba, White, Odegaard and Saka was what ripped West Ham apart yesterday. I completely agree. And we see that in the fifth goal. Uh, we see it in lots of the goals. But in particular with this fifth goal, because as much as he inverted, this is what we talk about, tactical fluidity, asking different questions. Now, I'm, not, I'm really not trying to do the whole I told you so thing. Um, <laughs> although I think I've said that line a few times recently. <laughs> but my point is, when we ask Arsenal just to try different things, I'm not saying that, go buy £300 million worth of players. I'll oh, just be better. We're saying... There are things you can do in the 90s to just ask different questions. And West Ham were one of the teams that we struggled to break down and then we lost to Fulham. And you're like, why are we not trying different things? Why is it always get the ball out wide to Saka and hope he does something? Arsenal have thrown different questions at teams 
especially more recently, but certainly in this game. So while White and Verdi, you're right to mention overlapping, because in this situation, they actually did a little bit of analysis. I think it was on Sky match there, I can't remember. But essentially, Emerson is having to keep an eye on Ben White because he's overlapped. White doesn't get the ball. White never looks like he's going to get the ball in this move. But because he's holding that position out wide, Saka's able to pick up that pocket. And then they're on the back foot, West Ham, and he cuts inside, and it's a really, really brilliant goal. But that position that Ben White takes up is really important. I'm actually going to slow it down one more time. Let's take it to a quarter speed. Um, because Erdegaard just here, he flicks. It's really clever from Erdegaard. And Saka just sort of lets it roll past him into the area and inside. But it, it's the reason Emerson can't block that pass in Saka is because Ben White's there as well. Um, and I just think that sort of fluidity, seeing Saka do well out wide, seeing him in more central spaces, seeing him white invert, back, but go the other way as well. So I've been saying about Zinchenko when he's inverting is, can he go on the outside sometimes when we need? And we saw our inverted fullback in this game, uh, Ben White, actually do something a little bit different. And comparing him to Zinchenko, I just wanted to see, and I've got to be honest, I don't really think it proves anything, but I'll show you the numbers as I did the research anyway. I wanted to show everyone how Ben White's numbers compared to Zinchenko and his average this season. So Ben White from this game. So against West Ham, he had a pass completion rate of 93%. Zinchenko averages 88% for the season. He has 77 touches. Zinchenko averages 92. Wow. He uh, had eight progressive passes, Ben White. Zinchenko averages 12 for the season. Uh, his progressive passing distance is 257 yards in this game, Ben White. Zinchenko averages 371. And he had three passes into the penalty area, Ben White, in this game. Zinchenko Zinchenko averages 2.5. So, is he the new Zinchenko? Listen, I think those numbers are really good, but it's also to just say fair plays, isn't he? Those numbers are actually really, <laughs> really good. good. It good makes numbers. you realise yeah, how quite how brilliant he is. Yeah. We're, we're waxing lyrical about White in this performance, mm. but Zinni still is top, top when it comes to inverting and progressing us up the pitch. I thought White, though, did a fabulous job, and this was very inspired by Mikel Arteta. I think so, and I think if uh, Zinni's not going to be available, you do need to have an alternative uh, plan, and I think uh, White demonstrated that yesterday. I thought the other key thing for me yesterday was uh, Bakaya Saka. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Champions League's coming back in uh, to play shortly. The Premier League now is coming in towards the business end of the season, the last third, and he's back in the goal scoring numbers. He scored a goal last week against Liverpool and he's got two again yesterday. He's the complete attacking force for me mm -hmm. in terms of technical security on the ball, pace, power and athleticism. He's got all those Intelligence, intelligence, well, yeah. and the way he runs with the ball, the way he slows down when he needs to slow down, then he can just burst. People say he's only left-footed. Obviously, he is mainly left-footed, but he scored with his right foot at Forest the other week. I thought uh, he also went close a couple of times yesterday with runs into the box. I love to see him, and I've been calling for this for a while, James, and, and I love the way now we're getting him inside, you know, closer to goal. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I thought yesterday he was, obviously, he was a lot of people's man of the match. You could have three or four players for us for a man of the match, you know, but he had a, a brilliant performance yesterday, Saka. He was fantastic. His numbers, 92% pass accuracy, 76 touches, 47 out of 51 passes completed. Phenomenal for a winger and final third player. Um, and, and I'm not going to read them all. Just hit pause if you want to read them because <laughs> they are just phenomenal numbers and there's so many of them. Another player... Before you go on, yeah. we've got to say, he, yesterday scored his 50th and his yeah. 51st Arsenal goals. He scored now 100 goals for Arsenal in 210 appearances by the age of 22. The youngest to do it since Frank Stapleton, who I remember in my youth, yeah. back in 78. Those numbers, they're insane numbers for a guy who's only 22. I yeah. mean, the debate is around where he's world class. He probably isn't quite world class yet, yeah. but he's going in that direction. He's going in that direction. And, and those numbers, when you think, when he came into the Arsenal team, James, uh, we were 10th in the league. Yeah. He said, I can remember he put that tweet out, Arsenal fans deserve better. Yeah. He's the one who's taken this club back to where we should be under Arteta. His numbers the last two seasons have been phenomenal. He's very rarely injured, is he? No. Uh, and I think there's an argument with who's the better player of him and Foden. Um, I think F they say, well, uh, oh, they're different. Foden has to compete in a, to get into a Manchester City team. But I think that works in Foden's favour because he's rotated out of the team and he gets rest. Saka plays every minute of every game. Uh, virtually, and, and he's, he's our, he's our go-to player, isn't yeah. he? he he's, he's, he's the person who just keeps on giving. Yeah. And I thought yesterday was one of his best performances this season. brilliant. 100 goal contributions in, in 210 10 games. It's like unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable. But away De you go, Cameron. Well, Declan Rice <laughs> deserves a mention. Wow. So many do, but we've got his numbers as well. And the thing is, Declan Rice, for me, 
If we're talking man of the matches, I have Saka in there, I have Rice in there, I have Trossard in there, I have Gabriel in there, I have Erdogan in there. And that's not to say that Martinelli, Havertz, Kivio, Saliba, White weren't all Brit. They were all outstanding. I really, everyone played a part. I'm not even just sort of being kind by chucking Havertz in there. I thought he did lots of really good, like I said, off the ball work, lots of really good kind of in and around the penalty area, very secure, picking out really good passes, showed real intelligence tactically and sort of, you know, technically in and around the penalty area. Everyone did really, really good stuff. But Declan Rice deserves a mention. A for that goal, B for those two assists, C for the occasion it was, and his numbers, 93% pass accuracy uh, with 17 out of 90 final third passes completed, four out of five crosses completed, four key passes, two big chances created, two assists and a goal. But he's becoming a bit of a, a creator of set pieces yeah, for us is, now. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that? I thought when uh, Arsenal decided to shell out 105 million for Declan Rice, they didn't exactly zero on... We were, we're zero actually getting Ward Prowse. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't zero in on the fact that he would be creating goals from corners, yeah. did they? But that's what he's become. What I liked about his performance yesterday was, James, this was a big game for him to go back to West Ham. They were booing him. I think he had something like nine touches in the first five minutes and he was booed. Mm. Yet by the end of the game, they were clapping him off the pitch. He had 59 touches in that first half, most of any, any player on the pitch. He was the one who was in that six role directing us forward. Uh, his delivery from the set plays now is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and two assists yesterday and the goal you're rightly said there was a 2% chance of him scoring from that position. It was a, an unbelievable strike. And then, of course, he didn't celebrate. He, he was respectful to the West Ham fans. And he, I think, got a lot of credit yesterday on Sky from Roy Keane, who was being the, the, almost like the physical player who could drag Arsenal towards his title if he stays fit. And I think that's high praise from Keane. Like all Sky, it must really hurt them to have to praise an Arsenal player. But he recognised yesterday how good Declan Rice was and that was a great performance. Yeah, it really, really was. And speaking of our set pieces, Nicholas Yeva does deserve a mention. But he sent me this really good graphic from The Athletic that showed us how many goals Arsenal scored from corners this season. 11. I think it's like 14 from set pieces, I think, in total for the season. But we know it's 11 from corners. Two more than Everton. Uh, Tottenham, funny enough, have eight. Luton have eight as well. But Arsenal leading the way of that. Look, it's a really good thing that we're able to unlock that first goal from set pieces at times. We did it against Palace and we did it now against, you know, we did it, I think, at Anfield when we went one up. We've done it in this game. Yeah, most it's, goals now from corners, most goals from set plays. Yeah. Tremendous credit to the set piece coach. We are looks, looking so dangerous. And I love the way yesterday, they've, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of great set piece moves this season from various clubs who employ set piece coaches, but we're up there with the best of them. The way we move defenders yeah. around and the way we attack uh, dead balls is. Is, is so hard for teams to read and to pick up. And I think, you know, it's no, no secret and, and, and doesn't surprise me the fact that we're scoring so many goals from set plays. We yeah. are a really dangerous team now from set plays, we aren't are. we? Just as you get that up, I just want to mention Gabriel one more time. I know I've mentioned him with some of the other players I thought were candidates for Man of the Match. Gabriel is emerging as a serious leader in this Arsenal team. He really is Gabriel. He gets big goals for us. He loves the one-on-one -on -one battles. He's there to stick up for his teammates. He's on the ball, and people say that's his weak part of the game. That might be true. He's still mm. brilliant on the ball. Um, and he's trusted now in the middle of the defence to play out. Yeah, it, he's up for any, any, any occasion. He is the centre-back you yeah, want. And he's so I love dangerous him. from a set player. Uh, and to think early in the season, he wasn't in the team at the start of the season. There was that talk of him leaving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's amazing to think back to that now, what he's become. But he, as I say, arguably, along with Odegaard, has been... Uh, Arteta's best signing, but he was brilliant yesterday. Well, I was going to say, is he pound for pound the best well, signing? Obviously, you know, well, obviously, I don't know, it's million. between him and Odegaard, isn't it? Very good. Also, a shout out to Trossard. Yes, he so scored our 8,000th league goal yesterday. I did, and I think that what he did on the ball, two moments of class. One, the pass through to Saka that led to the penalty. The weight and mm. uh, pace of the pass was perfect for Saka. Yeah. And then his goal. I thought the goal was excellent, the way he manoeuvred himself in position to get the shot away. That was an outstanding goal. And also, he's off the ball work. He was sort of like manipulating situations for himself in front of the, the when they were dropping deep, and he was getting in so many different pockets. Yeah, I couldn't terrific. work out if he was playing eight, nine, ten. He did everything. He, he was absolutely Him brilliant. and Erdogan Havertz were constantly yeah. picking up each other's pockets and moving brilliant. around. It was, it was brilliant. brilliant. Take it away with the roundup stats. Right, the closing stats for this week, James. Arsenal registered their joint biggest margin of victory in an away league match. And their first such win by six goals since December 1935. That was a 7-1 win at Aston Villa. They also scored six goals away from home in the Premier League against the David Moyes team for the second time. They beat Everton 6-1 in August 2009. Do you remember that one? Start of the season. Oh, I think yeah. Fabregas was in the team that day. Yeah, Fabregas. Didn't Nilsson score? Yeah, I, I think know. he did. Yeah, I think yeah, he maybe. did. You're right. 
Uh, Gabriel Magalhães has scored 14 goals for Arsenal in the Premier League, the most by a defender in the competition since the start of 2020-21. Declan Rice assisted two goals in the Premier League home game for the first time in his career and with his second half strike, it was also the first time that he'd been directly involved in three or more goals in the Premier League. Bakaya Saka scored his 50th and 51st goals for the club in only his two tenth appearance, as we've said. He now has 100 goal contributions at the age of 22. The youngest Arsenal player to score so many goals in all comps since Frank Stapleton. Arsenal ended the game fielding a front three of N. Waneri, Enketia and Nelson. Did you know that? Yeah. All who have progressed from scholarship terms. And finally, James, I know you love your sport. Mm -hmm. You probably were up late last night following the Super Bowl. I was. I'm you exhausted. Was. It wouldn't have escaped your attention then that last night was the 58th Super Bowl in America. Yeah. Uh, every single one has taken place since Spurs official last won a league title 22,945 years, uh, years ago. Uh, 22,945 days ago. How about that, mate? <laughs> Take what it. a ripper to end with. <laughs> I love it. I saw that stat like the Super Bowl. I could not believe it. <laughs> they won a league title since the Super Bowl. So anyway, listen, <laughs> I'm going to go get some rest because I was up till 5am watching the Super Bowl. But there you go. Big thanks to Graham as always. Hope you enjoyed the show. and Hit the like button if you did. And get in the comment section as well. We want to know your thoughts. Arsenal made it four wins in a row. 16 goals in those four games since the Dubai trip. Arsenal have put themselves in the thick of a title race and next week it's Burnley and we carry on again. See you then.